Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Prime Talk. Today, I have a special guest. Today, I'm having Jeff Lieber. Jeff is the founder of Turnkey Product Management, which is a leading Amazon marketplace and marketing agency. So, uh, Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Good to connect again. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, you know, good to see you. Uh, I've seen you, uh, you know, a couple of times in the past, but today's episode, we're going to dive into your story. We're going to go even deeper. You're going to, you know, it's going to be the story of Jeff Lieber. You're going to share with us everything. Who are you? Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Um, you know, how'd you begin your professional career station to station until we reach to where you are today with the world of e-commerce. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Yeah, sounds good, man. Yeah, I've never done a podcast quite like this. I always just talking about the nuts and bolts of Amazon. So I'm kind of excited and a little nervous to, uh, <laughs> to, to share the personal side, I guess. As long as you know your story, no reason to be nervous. You'll get it right. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was uh, born and raised in uh, Southern California in, in San Diego. And uh, yeah, I had a great family and, uh, you know, friends and support system. And, uh, you know, I was, had, had a good time, you know, playing some sports and um, did, did pretty good in school. Um, didn't try super duper hard through high school or, or college. Always just kind of did enough to procrastinate and, you know, get, get, uh, make sure you pass the class or a little bit Not better. Familiar, uh, kind of the same attitude I had, but um, <laughs> a little bit of background on the family, right? So your parents, what kind of industries were they involved with you know, when you were growing up? Yeah. My mom was a stay at home mom for uh, probably the first 10 or, or 12 years of my life. And then she started, she got back into uh, teaching preschool, um, which she loves doing and she still does it today. Um, teaching a couple of days a week. And, uh, you know, that's kind of rejuvenated her and given her more life. And, uh, nice. and then my dad, um, he used to work for Medtronic, the big, uh, you know, billion dollar medical company, and then got some patents. And then you know, he's an engineer by trade. And then he uh, ended up um, branching off and becoming an entrepreneur and starting his own business. So I, that was kind of, I think, you know, getting to see him do that and start, start a company with uh, a business partner and, um so yeah so that's you know saw them what kinda, kind of company did he uh start or run uh medical technology so like designing like heart catheters and stints and um you know different medical devices um they're working on one right now i think i'm allowed to share it is like a a cooling catheter that helps basically you know can help treat uh stroke stroke patients where uh if, if they're someone has a stroke you know in that first hour or two after you have a stroke, I mean, that critical period is where you either kind of, you know, typically either die if you, if you can't um, get treated. And, you know, but one quick thing you can do uh, that they're testing is they have a product that helps cool their brain. Um, so if you can, you know, have the uh, ambulance so cool. to them, you know, use, use a catheter and, and help. It's cool literally their, cool very, very brain. cool. Yeah, it's, it's a very cool product, literally, right? Because it cools uh, the brain down <laughs> during a stroke. So, uh, yeah, it sounds like it's high level innovation, you know, on the engineering side. So uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. OK, so that's kind of the environment that you had. Your mother's an educator. Your father's, you know, an engineer, entrepreneur, mm -hmm. uh, innovator. Um, and when you grew up, you besides, you know, kind of uh, uh, taking it easy in school and doing what you got to do, anything that you did uh, was entrepreneurial or, you know, uh, you're trying to make some extra money on the side, anything like that? Yeah, there's a few things with uh yeah, like trading baseball cards, stuff like that. But then actually my high school senior project was uh, you could do anything basically, but I decided to start an eBay business. So I went out on Black Friday with my dad and, uh, I like that. you know, went, went to Best Buy and bought, you know, a couple grand worth of stuff <laughs> and just tried to resell it on uh, on eBay and ended up making, you know, I think it was around $700 profit, something like that after after a few months selling through it all. Um, so that was kind of my first experience in the marketplace, uh, I guess you could say a real, real venture. And I was always interested yeah, in early like, sprouts, you know, small seeds of sprouts of, of you and e-commerce, uh, when you were growing up. Okay. So mm -hmm. let's head into, I guess, education, higher education, or what's the track there? Yeah. Then I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, uh, university, uh, say it again in, one more time and slowly. What was it? Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in, uh, in California, California, Polytechnia. What, what's the breakdown of that? Uh, California Polytechnic something rather i don't even know why they call it that people call okay, it good. slow or cal poly <laughs> got it cal poly cool so it's a it's a yeah it was a great a great school and uh i had a great time there and i was a business major finance major and um you know just didn't know exactly what i wanted to do but just figured that would give me a good a good base to to learn and 
um, yeah, so just uh, had a great group of friends that I, that I met there at college and, you know, moved away from home and, and really got to grow up and uh, mature and also <laughs> not be so mature at times, you know, and had, had a good time in college for sure. Didn't, didn't work uh, incredibly hard during, during college. Definitely had my share of good times, but, but, you know, I still was able to graduate in four years and then, uh, secure a job before. Nice. I even so, left. yeah. So when you graduate after four years, what year was that? Let's start, start putting timestamps on, on this uh, story. So you graduated, graduated 2010 college, All right, 2010, you graduate with a business degree and what's your first station, you know, in the professional world. Yeah. So I, uh, I think it was, how did I get it? at a job, a job fair, I believe at Cal Poly, like my last you know quarter at, at Cal Poly. Um, found a great company and interviewed with them in, uh, in uh, San Francisco. Um, they're called triage consulting group. Um, and, uh, they're about a 300 or 400 person company that does healthcare consulting. And it was just a really, it seemed like a really great, uh, first job out of college to kind of learn the consulting world. And, um, there's a, a very young company, a very fun. So you culture. had to relocate from South, Southern California to Northern California. Yeah. So I moved up to San Francisco and, you know, lived in North beach there and lived there for five years and, uh, got, got the job, um, got the job there. And, uh, it was just a really fun culture and great first job, you know, pretty, pretty good, safe pay out of college. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was just a great time and a really there for fun five years? city to live. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So what was your evolution there? Like, what was the, your, the, the, the dynamics of your work and you, what you used to do there? Yeah, basically, uh, Essentially, we're, we're finding underpayments from health insurance companies. So if someone goes to the hospital and has like, you know, they stay at the hospital in a coma for six months or something like that, you know, it could be a $2 million hospital bill. And then Anthem Blue Cross or one of those companies, you know, typically will try to find ways to underpay or, or pay, pay less. And then when the claims are that big, there's just a lot of money that's uh, and there's so many claims every day and, and lack of payments. So. So this company just they, they found their niche that they were they were the first ones to really go hard and in, in underpayment recovery and man they they made some good money and they, they just sold so, so give me one company. example so you got the institution and the hospital right the bill mm -hmm. two million the insurance company comes in and pays only what a million or a million and a half instead of two and then the the, the, the your company that you work for they, they find that discrepancy and then they go back to the insurance company and say hey, you underpaid meaning they agreed to pay more but they underpaid that's what happened exactly like. Typically, uh, uh, you know, Anthem Blue Cross has like a, a contract with the, that hospital and they agree on all this rate schedule and everything. And then we basically built like, you know, in not Microsoft Excel, but Microsoft Access, we build these like formulas. And, and, you know, it was a pretty crazy advanced system that they built that we got to use, calculate, oh, wow, they're, they're, they underpaid by $250,000. Then you just simply write a one page template appeal letter saying for this claim, this patient, this data service, you underpaid by 250,000 per this clause. And then, you know, three weeks later, sometimes most of the time they would, they would pay it. And then, you know, we, we would get, I didn't get a commission, but the company got a commission. Yeah. It sounds like, uh, you know, it's very data driven. It's finding discrepancy through data and taking action. Once the discrepancy is found, pretty much it's sounds, sort of it like, sounds Katita. like, <laughs> sounds like a Tita and a different uh, planet, uh, the health, uh, right. healthcare industry. Wow. It's, uh, you know, we were distant relatives, uh, you and I, I guess. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't put that together now. There, there yeah, you go. I'm pulling on your threads to make you understand that it's very similar to what we do. We <laughs> utilize data uh, to, to find discrepancy. And of course, once it's found, you take further action and then you get a financial recovery. So uh, you just uh, walk in my mind into this <laughs> other industry, which is pretty amazing, pretty cool. And what was the name of the company again? It was called Triage Consulting Group, and they sold, I think, in the last couple of years to some. I, I don't recall the name of the company that that bought it. Um, you know, but to some. Big, what was their strength? Their strength was the technology, the algorithm, the ability to find the discrepancy, or to take action on it, or a combination of everything. Uh, yeah, they they, they were just the big player in the space. Number one, so like, because once once you sign a contract with a with a hospital, then you know. Um, it's hard to like for a competitor to come in and under undercut them. And then also like they, they were just, they, they built this in Microsoft access, like very complex, uh, sophisticated sort of algorithm for like plugging in, you know, three years worth of hospital claims. And then yeah, it's a lot of money, click, yeah, a lot of data. Click, click these macro buttons and spits out, like, you know, they just built some really sophisticated ways to identify those underpayments and then and what was your know, role there you were in the development side or the, the product side or the sales side the business development what was your uh, complaint uh, with yeah on, on like kind of the auditing side so it would actually help 
run those formulas and run the macros and then actually file the appeals and then actually go out to the client sites in the hospitals and build relationships with them and, you know, report back to them in, in status meetings, things like that. That's the first thing off of, uh, you know, when you started the position there, that's how you started or you started at the different position you grew out to that outfit. Yeah, it was, it was basically that position. And at first you don't talk much or do very much. And then by the end, you're managing a small team of, you know, seven people, you know, after a few years. So it was cool. I really got to learn a lot about management and, and uh, manage other people and uh, clients as well. And I assume uh, for the hospitals, you know, every hospital that you contract with, it's the recoveries in within the millions or tens of millions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, most of the time. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, all right. Maybe, so, maybe that... Katita, maybe Katita can, uh, you know, l- launch a subsidiary business. That eh? no, we can reach out to them, see if they need any help with, um, uh, you know, uh, technology of, of for auditing and mass data. But that's that's a different day, different discussion. Yeah. For now, this is still uh, still the story of Jeff Lieber. So, <laughs> uh, 2015, you move on to your next station, and, and what was the next station for you? Yeah. So basically I'd always been on marketing entrepreneurship sort of email lists and I'd bought some courses and refunded them or didn't take action, you know, uh, over the years. And I knew I wanted to try to start something. And so about a year, you know, about four years into working at triage, I I saw the, the Amazon opportunity. This is about 2014. This is when people started selling Amazon courses. And, um, I just started hearing more about it. And so I I invested a few thousand dollars into one of those Amazon courses and uh, went through it. The business model made sense to me and I I was really interested in it. And so I chose a a product and out of all the products in the world, I I decided to, uh, you know, land on puppy training pee pads as the one product to, uh, to start with for whatever reason. What was it again? Puppy, puppy what? puppy training pee pads they're like you know when you get a new puppy you gotta like you know train them how to pee on something not the carpet uh-huh. so yeah so i bought a 20 foot container from china for like fifteen thousand uh, dollars as my first ever product order um which in hindsight now i realize you, you don't need to go that big or that risky uh for your first ever product order but i did it and maybe it helped me it forced me to like you know go all in and, and learn you know, was that like financially a big thing for you? Uh, like, like, you know, life savings or dramatic uh, or that's kind of in the middle or even, you know, this yeah, is at, you. at that time it was probably about like half my life savings. You know, I maybe had 30 grand to my name, something like that. But, and you have that enough confidence to put half your life savings to, for this, you know, cause once again, this is a side gig for you. You have your career mm-hmm. already developed with uh, triage, right? And then you take a few courses online, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, any of the courses was ASM by any chance, Amazon selling machine? Yeah. Yeah. One of them was. Yep. ASM. Got it. So yeah, it's more were, than one course. You did a few courses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that solidified your confidence saying, I'm going to go for, you know, I'm going to do my research and I'm going to base my data and invest 15 grand. And okay. So you launched, how'd it go? Yeah. It, uh, it launched and, you know, I got like, when I remember when I got my first sale after like two weeks and you know, I got the little alert on the, on the phone and like literally almost started crying or maybe I did cry. Oh, I can't remember, wow. but I remember like, I was like, Holy crap. Like some random person in Kentucky, you know, just bought, bought the product for 30 bucks. And I was like, okay, like, so this is real. And, uh, it ended up taking about like nine months to sell through that container but, uh, but you know, it, it started selling and started getting reviews and, you know, optimized the listing and, you know, ended up getting some real, real sales, which was really cool. And, uh, yeah, and then I ended up launching a few other products. So then I started chasing some product trends and, um, you know, some hot fat pro- fad products, you know, and then, you know, that, that made money for two months and then the fad died. And so I kind of learned that painful experience, but, uh, yeah, sold a variety Did you replenish on that $15,000 product, the, the Peapod or you, you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's still selling, still selling. It's still today. your hero product. It's still a hero product for you. Um, why? Well, so I ended up ended up selling uh parachute pad. If we fast forward, I ended up selling that that business um a few years later. Actually, this is the the uh, pre uh, aggregator days or post uh, or during the aggregator days. Uh, pre agency. Yeah, this is pre agency. So basically, I no, I'm saying pre aggregators. You know, today you have like big aggregators. Oh. Like, uh, yeah, so it you, was, you it was pre it. that. It was like 2017 or 2018, oh, yeah. Okay, got it. So let me re- re- recap this. So 2014, you launched. And then 2015, what happened? You went solo or, or on a... Yeah, so yeah, maybe I should cover that. So ended up launching a few extra products. So I had like four or five SKUs by the end of the first year. 
and you know but i was still just doing this at uh, at night and on the weekends when i had time like only 10 hours 15 hours a week and then we were selling maybe like 10 grand 12 grand a month in, in sales when like you say we somebody was there with you or just still you solo you just uh, all week it, it was just me. I mean, I had a, a few like VAs in, um, Got it. You okay, know, in, small in team, India. Team. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, uh, yeah, but we, so after about nine months or so of that, I was like, you know, like if I put, what if I put 40 hours or 50 hours a week into this? And, um, you know, I just, I saw the opportunity and just said like, you know, when else like i'm not married i don't have kids like i'm just living in i got cheap rent in, in san francisco somehow and uh, yeah. i was like and i you know i, I just read tim ferris's book and um you know the tim four, Ferris, hour, work the four hour work week yeah yeah and he had a good fear setting exercise if anyone has ever heard of that you can google it it's called his fear setting exercise and that that was what helped me convince me to quit my job and go all in on the business but it basically from what I remember, you, you basically write out like, okay, what's this big decision I'm scared of? Well, actually write out what's the actual worst case scenario, like absolutely worst case nightmare scenario. How bad is it? And I wrote it out as like, maybe I get scammed from my Chinese supplier and they, you know, take my money and Amazon cancels my account. And, you know, I end up losing the, you know, 20 grand that I put into the business. And, um, you know, I don't have any income coming in you know, but I, and I, you know, basically I'm at zero dollars back to zero dollars. Um, and that, that was the worst case. And I was like, well, but, if that uh, happened, but, that, but at that point, yeah, if that happens, you'll be able to rebound. Yeah. Basically like if that happened, like I could one, you know, always go back and live at my parents' house. If I had to, like they would take me back in, they took my brother and sister back in a couple of times. So I knew they would take me in. Uh, they, they owed me one if, if I needed it. And, uh, so that was like worst, worst case, you know, or you stay at some friends' houses, bounce around or, or you know, go back and just get another job. It's not, you know, not the yeah, end it's of pretty the world. Good. Yeah. You have a lot, you know, a landing pad, you know, uh, you know, you, you don't lose money, you break even, but then you can kind of re reset things. You live by, live by family, then, you know, go yeah. work for, uh, you know, go back to the industry you're working in or a similar industry. Yeah. Uh, okay. So it was a calculated bet, but no, nevertheless, you took the leap of faith. You, you, uh, spread your wing, uh, uh, and then you went solo 215 and take us from there. Watch on yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Then you look at the upsides like, well, this could change my life forever and I could, it could work out and I don't have to work for anybody ever again. And so, um, so yeah, I went for it, went all in, worked hard, got to travel the world, got to go to, you know, mapped it out. So I got to go to the Canton fair in China. And then I went to Thailand and lived there for a month. And I stopped in Europe along the way. Like, so I, I literally circumvented the globe um, I think in like 65 days and all while work while slash working and, and making um, money, making profit, right? Yeah. And making profit, making money, negotiating prices with the suppliers, you know, just having time in my life in Thailand, like never been somewhere, you know, exotic and, and really cool like that. And yeah, it just like opened my eyes. Like, okay, like no matter what happens, like this is worth, this is worth it. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah. And then luckily, you know, we ended up growing it. And then at that time, I had gotten into another business partnership with my friend's dad who, who uh, invented a, 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 a it's called the Hurricane 9 100 foot ring launcher dog toy. So it was this awesome and it's still for sale out there today. I'm no longer working in the business um, or own it anymore. But um, anyways, we did a partnership. I helped him launch it on Kickstarter and then Amazon. And it's just the coolest dog toy, you know, uh, one of the coolest out there. And uh, so did form that partnership with him. And then at that small, same small question on the side, you have any pets on your, of your, of your own, or this is just no. you happen to just, <laughs> that's the other funny thing. I had no pets and I got no, no kids. And I also launched a baby brand and sold that too. When I sold. So yeah, like I sell, I sell things that I don't necessarily know that much. Consume. About. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> okay. So you said uh, you had the, 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 the dog toy and you were saying that there's another uh, trajectory that happened. Yeah. So then, you know, got into a, a partnership with him and helped him launch that. And then, um, and then at the same time, my friend from college, uh, from Cal Poly, he launched a sunglasses brand on Kickstarter with like bottle opener sunglasses called William Painter sunglasses, which is, you know, they're my favorite glasses. I still wear them today. I've opened hundreds of beer bottles and, you know, it's a great conversation starter. And so yes. they were doing well on Kickstarter and Shopify. 
but they were not getting any traction on Amazon. So they said, Jeff, can you help us out? And they said, can we just pay you to manage it for us? So I was like, oh, okay. I think I could you know, manage the time for that. So that was basically my first agency client, but I didn't view it as an agency client. I didn't know it could be a business. Yeah, just trying to be helpful, useful. But you, what year was that when you onboarded your first uh, yeah, that was like 2000, 2016. Yeah. And right, uh, so this is where you're already two years into the mix. At that point, you have your own brand, a partnership, and then uh, your yeah. first client. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah. So help grow them from, you know, they were doing like a few grand a month to, you know, six figures in the first year uh, of selling with them. And um, but I want to jump into that uh, for a minute because now we're talking to, you know, three launches, yours, uh, your <laughs> partnership, and then this, um, uh, you know, this client. But what's your what's your strategy? How do you do that? What's what's your magic, so to speak, of of uh, or, you know of launching products on Amazon? At, at the time, I know today it might be a different ballgame, but at the time, yeah, I mean, at the time, this was back in yeah 2016, 17. So it was a slightly different game. Like there was you know other things that I mean, the same principles apply. Like the same principles of success apply to Amazon with having a super optimized listing and having great products and you know, all that, all that good stuff. But at that time, you know, some of the things that are now banned, like, you know, the, the review groups and uh, incentivized reviews and things like that, friends and family. Um, but were you the, also in charge of the, 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 the copyright and the visuals mm-hmm. and, and, and all the creative as well? Yeah. Yeah. Or and at that help. point you have already yeah. set up an agency or studio or the, the factories or what was your setup there for, for the creative? Yeah. So basically I was kind of utilizing the same team that I was using for my own brands for, you know, my, my friend's sunglasses brand. And then they referred a, a friend's you know, fish, fish tank brand, and then they referred a friend. And so then I had four brands uh, that I was managing for clients and um, we, we would outsource like some of like, you know, if it was like a photo shoot or a video shoot, like it's not like I have that like in house, you know, but yeah. we would help you know, either orchestrate or set that up essentially. Um, but yeah, so then all of a sudden I had all these different brands, you know, these, these clients essentially, and that was doing really well. But then as you could probably guess, like I was so spread thin, so overwhelmed and all three of these businesses were basically growing equally slowly. Mm -hmm. And I was like working like 70 hours a week or more and I was more stressed than I'd ever been. And like, honestly, all I and wanted was And you don't work for yourself life. anymore. Yeah, you work for your clients. All, right? all, Think yeah. about that. Right. Yeah. All I wanted to do basically was go back and, and get my old nine to five job back in really? San Francisco. Wow. Although, you know, there's times where it's like, well, like I was making, you know, like that was a pretty ni- nice life. Like I've overwhelmed myself and I didn't design this. I kind of just said yes to, sum- to too many things is what Got I did. Shiny, shiny object syndrome. Mm-hmm. So, so then I just had to make a life decision and like, what do I really want to focus on and scale? What would be the best for me and, and my life? And, um, and so I decided, you know, I really am liking the, the agency and, and helping other clients and, uh, I'm really good at that. And my team's really good at that. And so I said, why don't I just stick with that? And so I decided to, you know, prep my business to be sold. So I sold, um, the pet brand and baby brand. Uh, which I which I owned all of that, and I sold that within seven months. I think is how, how long. And this is you said 2017, yeah. Yeah, 2017. Kind of early days. This is like a year or two before the the explosion of all the aggregators that today they're snapping out uh, brands left mm-hmm. and right. And okay, so you went directly with the buyer. You did use a I use banking a bro- brokers. I, I use a broker to help take us to market and and get get buyers. And we got like five offers on the business and uh, negotiated the best one. Was it okay if we asked, so what was the multiple on the EBITDA or the SD? Uh, the yeah. Seller discretion earning? At that time, day? I think it was like 3.3 or something like that. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Today we're 2021 towards the end of it. And today uh, the rate usually is around the five, five X, mm-hmm. uh, five times on the uh, multiple on, on the mm-hmm. earnings. Um, okay. So things have inflated there. Uh, all right. 2017, you sell to one, uh, ent- you sell to one party, uh, all, all of the portfolio of a brand you had? Just the two brands. Yeah, they bought the portfolio together. Yeah, that you own that you're your partner account. with, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Got or no, okay. not with my partner. So just th- those two brands that, that I you own. That, uh, right, 100% yeah. you. No, no partnership. I sold that. Yes, not the partnership. That's separate. And uh, yeah, so then the partnership, that that was kind of, you know, 
uh, just had its difficulties. We, we, you know, we didn't see eye to eye, me, me and the partner on, on certain things. Um, he was more old school. I was more new school. You know, I wanted to scale using Facebook ads and, you know, he, he you know, wanted to see instant return and, you know, it, I could have done things different as well. So it just, it was a stressful partnership and, uh, and, and it was one of my best friend's dad. So I didn't, I wanted to make sure to keep that friendship in, right. intact. And so I decided like, I just, any way possible to get out of that partnership. And so, um, exited that partnership didn't, didn't make, you know, much money off of it, but I, it was better for me. Just yeah. To you get kept the out. dignity, you kept the balance, you got out, you know, nice and easy, everybody's friends and, and off you go to the next, uh, you know, point of focus for you. So you sold two, detached from one. And then what else happened? What was the next move? Yeah. So then all I had left was turnkey product management and we're doing full service management for, for product, product brands, you know, on Amazon and just went all in on that and built, built a team. And so then I hired my sister, my cousin, some of their friends from their uh, softball team and just sort of, you know, built a, a small team of, you know, trying to figure out how to build an agency team of like client managers and you know, US based team members, which I hadn't done before. And, um, you know, just hired people that I trusted and, uh, yeah. And then just started, started growing it, uh, you know, and went through bumps along the way, but, you know, and then here we are, you know, uh, four years later and, and we've grown a, a lot and now we've got over, got over 20 different team members, uh, on the team now, uh, mostly in the U S and some in the Philippines and, uh, yeah, it's been quite, the, quite the ride. Nice. And this, uh, when you started, you know, growing the team and really focusing just on uh, turnkey, um, that was 2017 or 2018. Uh, that was, yeah, 2017. Yeah. Cause when I knew I was selling the business, I kind of already was pivoting focus to, to turnkey. Got it. Okay. So let's uh, try to encapsulate, uh, you know, 2017 until 2021, where we are today, these four years, you know, obviously you grew with 20, you know, to 20 uh, team members and uh, maybe you can touch more about, you know, um, the growth of, of, uh, you know, the, the clients, the brands you work with or the, 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 your experience, how it matured or, you know, improved over time and how even the dynamics of, of Amazon give us a little bit of, you know, evolution of, of 217 until today on the strategies, you know, hardcore tactics, like you say, the, the other events or shows that you uh, appear on. This is the moment where we can get more into the, you know, bolts and screws of, of uh, how things get done. We'll, you know, we'll dedicate a few minutes to that and then we'll try to, you know, uh, uh, summarize the, the episode and see what we got. Yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, so I mean, Amazon, the, the principles still are, are the same. Um, but yeah, back in the day, you could kind of use these black hat, gray hat, you know, what would be gray hat now? And they were okay at the time, or just not in force and, and all that. And so back in the day, people could come in, throw up a product listing, as long as it was decently optimized, they could use these, you know, they could use these companies out there. I won't name the, the names of them, but those companies where, you know, they would basically uh, get, get a thousand sales, you know, in, in a day and then boost you to, um, you know, to page one. Right. And they were like free sales, essentially, you could buy your way to the top of, of Amazon and you would actually stick there. And you could, you could and, buy. And do you, when you say stick there, why you were able to stick there because, Nobody else was toppling you down or what was oh, you could just manipulate people could people were manipulating the Amazon algorithm and they knew what would rank you there and keep you there. And the algorithm wasn't smart enough to detect where what was fake, you know, Got it. Uh, unauthentic buying behavior. And so they would. They so would, the like, seller sophistication was here. Amazon's ability to track them was kind of there. So you're able to go there and stay yeah. there. OK. And yeah. So happened? people could come in with basically no experience, but just, you know, some decent pockets and the willingness to be super aggressive. And so people were just launching these brands, especially like in the supplement space and, you know, just take advantage of these incredibly big markets and, and just, you know, doing stuff that, you know, wasn't really tra transparent or real. We, we weren't doing that stuff, but at that time, those, that was, those people were coming, was it was hard, it was hard to compete with, with those companies at that time. And then Amazon started cracking down on fake reviews and on like, you know, things like these fake re rebates and fake purchases and, uh, you know, these manipulative practices, which I actually think has, has been good for, for the Amazon marketplace, for the Amazon shoppers and buyers, because sure they're, that. you know, they're, they're buying less fake crappy products that, that shouldn't be at the top and selling the way that they are. And, and I think it's actually helped 
the real people who care about making good products and, and great, you know, actually great products and doing things the right way, they can now be more successful on Amazon because you can't use those black hat things anymore, or, you know, you could try, but you're going to get caught or, or kicked off eventually. So I think it's actually, it, it's, you can't just throw something up and it's going to make a million bucks tomorrow on, on Amazon. You know, you, you really got to go back to the, to the principles of marketing and business and building a brand, building great products and, um, you know, you, you got to do things the right way, uh, these days. And I could dive more into it if you want. Yeah. Let's have a bit more into that. So I have a brand. I want to launch it. I come to turnkey. What do you guys do for me? Uh, you know, nowadays, how does it all work out and how long would it take to really, uh, make this a viable, uh, brand, you know, with, with, uh, you know, a substantial income and, and, and profits and stuff and stuff. Yeah. Sometimes companies come to us and they haven't launched on Amazon. Maybe they've already launched on Kickstarter or on Shopify and they, they want us to launch them from scratch onto Amazon. Um, you know, but, but most time, just because most companies now they're already selling on Amazon or they've been up and selling on Shopify and we'll actually just help take over and optimize their Amazon and then take over their Amazon PPC ads and all that good stuff. Um, but I could cover, um, if you were a brand launching from scratch on Amazon, what to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically we like to start working with the company, like talking to the company at least like two months prior to launch. And then maybe we would start working with you about a month prior to when you want to start taking sales. Cause we need about a month to start building your product listings and optimizing them built, you know, t taking all your image assets that you have your images and converting them using our graphic designers into, you know, uh, infographics with text overlay and, um, you know, those really beautiful infographics that you see on, on some, some really good listings out there, you know, writing the sales copy, uh, you know, doing the keyword research, you know, we do all of that stuff, all of the, the nuts and bolts to build up, you know, the, the most optimized listings possible, building the storefront on Amazon. Um, so, you know, we build the infrastructure and then also we, we basically have, you know, a, a meeting or two with the client to be like, okay, and then let's plan out the launch plan, right? How are we going to launch this to the world? Um, and so we look at, you know, every client's different. What are the assets that you have? Do you have uh, an email list? Do you have a Shopify list of customers? Do you have a social media following? Do you have a big influencer that you have a connection with? You know, any assets that you have, uh, do you have paid ads that you've done before? Um, we identify what those are. Usually someone has at least one asset that's at least somewhat decent, but hopefully they've got a couple. And then we built, we use those assets and we build them into the launch plan and say, okay, we're going to build up some hype before launch, you know, letting people know that this is coming, trying to kind of pre-sell or maybe get a pre-sell email list. Um, it just kind of depends on, on the client. Pre-sell on Shopify or pre-sell on Amazon? No, like pre-sell like an email list, like come here for a VIP discount or, you know, or early bird, uh, you know, uh, something like that. And then when it comes time to launch on launch day, in launch week, you know, that's when it's go time. So we turn on the Amazon listings, they go live. And that's when we start tapping into their, their assets more, more heavily, like, you know, doing a, an email sequence, the week of the launch, doing a social media post sequence to their social channels that they have um, tapping into the influencers, you know, throughout the first couple of weeks, because you really want to spread traffic out over the first few weeks. Like, if Amazon sees, you don't want to dump everything day one and then do nothing on day two or three or four. So the release, you keep releasing it in and dripping it in. And from all these um, uh, funnels, you know, social media, emails, uh, influencers, all these tracks lead into the Amazon listings. And hopefully uh, they're, they're, you know, they're engaged full and they convert. And then the Amazon, the algorithm sees, oh, this is, you know, a real, a real deal. It's, it's, a, it's a healthy product. And then you move up the ranks. That's just for launch and, you know, more move up the ranks and start, uh, you know, get that honeymoon period and the traction. But what do you do to keep it there? Just keep keep the same flow going, the whole flywheel of uh, engagement? Yeah, no, you summed that up perfectly. And then, yeah, after that, it it's still continuing to do that along, along the way. Um, but then it's time to really start focusing. You know, by that time, you will have some reviews. You can use things like Amazon Vine reviewer program. Um, these, you know, other ways and there's other tactics to get Amazon reviews. But once you get a few reviews, then it's time to really start um, dialing in on the Amazon pay-per-click PPC ads. Um, and then we also do Amazon 
DSP ads as well for for most of our clients. That platform, as well. Yeah. So you can drive traffic from uh, um, other websites or until yeah. you're retargeting uh, within Amazon. Yep, exactly. So Amazon PPC and DSP is one of the, the best ways to, to scale because Amazon is, has really improved their ad network over the last few years. They're the number three advertiser in the world uh, right now. Google, Facebook, um, Amazon, yeah? Yeah, exactly. I think that's the order of them, of the top two. I'm not sure about the order, but um, but yeah, but and they'll, they'll probably you know be closing in on number two, you know, knowing, knowing Amazon, but they've really increase the complexity of, of the ads and the, the variety of ads and the targeting and the retargeting that you can do and, you know, advertising on competitors, product pages and complementary products. So, you know, you can really get sophisticated and that's what we do. We have an amazing team that we've built and, and systems that we, that we do to really focus in on the, the PPC DSP scaling process. So that's where we are today, but 217, was it that robust or the past no. four years of layer after layer after layer, just add to your toolkit and to your capabilities and experience to make you guys much more robust and, you know, on the frontier of, of making things happen the right way on Amazon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Back then we, we weren't doing DSP back then. We only started doing DSP, I think about two years ago. Um, and, uh, and, and PPC was a lot simpler back then. There was only you know, a handful of, of ad types that you could run, but now it's just, you is know, it's fair to say that all these components, other, we weren't doing them, even now that you're doing them for a while, they keep evolving. Even, even every component has its complexity levels and they go deeper and deeper, more, more advanced. So, uh, not only that you have more layers of sophistication, each, each layer has its own uh, trajectory and evolution going on. Um, cause this is a, this is a learning curve for all of us. The, you know, industry is hyper dynamic, keeps on changing every day. And you always have to be you know, with your fingers on the pulse to make you know to keep it uh, relevant uh, for you and your clients. Um, okay, so everything that you you kind of mentioned, described for for um, you know for launches, also kind of the same methods apply for the ones who already launched on the market. But you you take over and you op- optimize everything, and you basically able to put them that on the flywheel and, and, and uh, keep a healthy trajectory. That's kind of the dynamic there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we've got some client like we launched a client this year in May of 2021. Uh, they were doing Shopify beforehand, uh, but they had just never taken the, you know, got, had the time they thought to, to launch on Amazon. They were so focused with their own stuff and they had great products, um, but they, you know, wanted to hire, hire someone to do it. So they hired us to do it. And in the month of, of May, we did a six figure launch in the very first month on Amazon. And in the first six months, we've sold over, uh, over $700,000 of, of revenue in the first six months for them. And, uh, you know, solid and all the 700 grand was uh, profitable for, for the end, for the, for the end client. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Great. Mm-hmm. That's pretty, so. pretty uh, impressive numbers there. All right. So, um, I want to kind of embody, uh, you know, the story so far and see what we got, uh, born and raised in, uh, California, uh, more on the San Diego side on the South. Right. And then, uh, went to school up North, uh, back in 2010, you already graduated. Sorry, you graduated in South Cal and then your first job offer, you got into in the San Francisco area. So you moved up North around 2010. Um, and, um, and from 2010 to, until 2015, you worked for, um, uh, the company that helps with, um, uh, auditing, uh, discrepancies or underpayments of, uh, insurance companies to, uh, health, uh, institutions. Uh, but around 2014, a year before you kind of spread your wings, you took all of these courses, uh, you know, regarding, you know, e-commerce and selling on Amazon. Uh, and then uh, that gained your confidence. And then you uh, invested $15,000 to launch your products out there and you're able to sell within nine months. And then around 2015, you get enough confidence to say, you know what, I have my own brand. I'm already also involved with another brand. I'm going to spread my wings. And instead of investing 10, 15 hours a week, I limit it. I'm, I'm going to be my own boss. Uh, then between 2015 until uh, 2016, 17, you found out you're your own boss, but you have other bosses because a uh, you had uh, your own brands, a, a partnership, plus uh, you know the first uh, ag- agency clients. Um, so you're spread out pretty thin. So you uh, made a conscious decision to kind of focus on what you are probably the best at and you're most effective at. So you cashed out of your uh, you know your brands. You sold them in 2017. You did a nice release with, um, you know, the partnership that you had because it was uh, the father of, of a good friend of yours. And then you really were able to harness your 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 uh, focus, talent, motivation, not just yourself, your own team, and uh, create uh, the infrastructure um, for turnkey, uh, you know, from 2017 until uh, today, 2021, to really become robust, you know, a leader on the forefront and be, be you know, you know, add layers and layers of sophistication and, and um, ability to, uh, you know, uh, launch properly or 
grow properly on the marketplace and keep a flywheel uh, going on. So that, in a nutshell, kind of the, the, the story we have here? Yeah, you said, you said it better than I did, yeah. Nice, nice. So, okay, so thank you so, so much for sharing. I, uh, I, I kind of learned a lot and I appreciate it. All right, so now I want to finish up the episode with two points. The first point will be if somebody wants to reach out and connect, where can they find you? But the last thing will be is what is your message of hope and inspiration for entrepreneurs listening out there? Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, man. This is awesome. Um, so, yeah, you could find me on LinkedIn. Uh, just search Jeff Lieber, Turnkey uh, should come up. Um, or you can go to turnkeyproductmanagement.com slash resources. Um, there's a lot of good, if you're interested in, in Amazon or if you have a business, a physical product business, you know, we've got a lot of great Amazon seller resources on there that are free to learn a little bit more about us or, or apply stuff to your business. Or you can hop on a call with us if you, you know, are, are interested in scaling with Turnkey. Um, so yeah, that's where to find me. And yeah, as far as, so you said a message of hope to entrepreneurs. Hope and inspiration. If you, you know, entrepreneurs listening out there, you know, what is your message of hope and inspiration? Whatever comes to mind. Yeah. Hmm. Important. Um, yeah. I mean, if you, if you want to be an entrepreneur, um, you know, you, you can do it if you can find, you know, but you have to be able to commit to find a way like it is a hard road. It is a bumpy road. It is stressful at times. It is amazing at times. Like it is a roller coaster. And if you have the personality for that, um, you just got to commit and know that, you, you know, you got to be resourceful and, and find a way and you, and you always will. And you'll, you know, you'll be able to bounce back on your feet, even if you have to go to zero or, or below zero, you know, you can always, find another way. Um, but the upside and the freedom and the flexibility, uh, that it provides you, you know, and, and the financial independence that, that it can provide you. If you, if you hit, if you hit those, those home runs or doubles or triples, you know, it, it can all be worth it. And, and I do think that it's worth it. And, um, so yeah, if you want to go after something and, uh, add value to the marketplace, you know, in whatever niche you're interested in, you know, you, you can do it, but you just got to work hard and, uh, you know, enjoy the moments along the way. Beautiful stuff. So opportunities out there, identify it, jump on it, commit to it and try to enjoy the ride, but work hard. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff. I hope everybody else enjoyed. Stay safe and healthy. Until next time. All right. Thanks.